Hello everyone, uh, indeed, I am Igor Stanin from the University of Twente. I am an assistant professor at the group of uh, multi-scale mechanics headed by Professor Stefan. Sorry. Can I make it a little higher? All right. Cool. So yes, I have to confess, uh, indeed, uh, this is not precisely the talk I was going to deliver originally, since uh, some results that I wanted to show here I did not really confirm, and some others are under NDA right now, so I ended up in a quite uh, a high-level talk uh, de detailing the, some stuff that I'm interested in, some stuff that I'm doing. Um, and it's going to be about applications of DEM to modeling solids. <clears throat> uh, here is my group. Uh, our group leader is Professor Stefan Luding, whom probably most of you know, uh, the student of Hans Hermann and the teacher of Katja Bertoldi. <laughs> and uh, yes, our group of multi-scale mechanics is known for the development of the, one of the major open source DM code, Mercury DPM. And uh, we interact with the industries uh, via spin-off Mercury Lab. And uh, yes, I'm uh, one of the main developers of the Mercury DPM. And uh, yes, the science that I'm doing at the University of Twente has a lot to do with the DEM. Okay, he, here are our major areas of activity. Stefan is mostly interested in acoustics and granular materials. Um, the other members of the group do multi-scale modeling and uh, concurrent uh, simulations, course training. Um, <coughs> We do some dissipative particle dynamics, um, uh, interact with industrial customers. And uh, what I am mostly interested in is modeling solids with DAM. And uh, also, I, I, as I usually put it, non-conventional applications of DAM. Like, first of all, let me say a few words about the DAM. I actually learned about discrete element method when came to Minnesota as a grad student. I came to straight to the warm hands of Peter Kandel, the inventor of DM, and uh, quite a nice community in Minnesota who were developing that method. Uh, it's basically the dynamic of uh, classical uh, rigid bodies, particles that have six degrees of freedom. As appeared, it appears that actually is very convenient and nice method to model granular matter, gr model frictional materials. Basically, once you model your particle as rigid bodies, you can resolve moments acting on particles, you can resolve shear forces, and the major shear forces, of course, friction, you can model, model frictional materials, etc., etc. Okay, a few words uh, about the um, algorithmical parts of the DEM I'll, I'll probably omit for, for, for the matters of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, DEM actually does require certain algorithm for contact search that is, uh, works faster than the straightforward and square complexity algorithm. You need to perform explicit time integration of uh, particle motion. Uh, in case of particles with spherical tensor of inertia, velocity Verlet algorithm works just fine. If you have to introduce non-spherical particles, the story gets more complicated, but in principle, it's also very doable. Um, of course, uh, the essence of DEM are contact models. Contact models uh, uh, historically have been introduced in DEM in a very, very ad hoc manner, not really rigorous. Later, people came up with uh, more rigorous procedures, how to introduce uh, uh, this sort of interactions based on the objective potentials that automatically conserve energy, momentum, uh, balance of momentum, etc. And of course, uh, there are basically ma 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 many different contact models depending on the sort of physics you would like to capture, either linear contact model or linear. Leonard Jones type of contact model, Hertz interaction, etc. Um, 
I just would like to give you some idea why, what, what do I call by non-conventional applications of DM. This is one of them. Uh, I've just uh, tried to compress the elastic spheres that was basically in the context of uh, some acoustic application and I found out that simply uh, uniformly compressed in three dimensions, elastic spheres compressed in three dimensions exhibit uh, unusually complex behavior. Like if you have spheres that are packed originally as BCC lattice, they perform bifurcation. Sometimes they prefer to evolve uh, to FCC lattice via so-called Bain path and sometimes they form so-called CI16 lattice and it really took me a crystallographer to understand what do I observe here in this DM simulation. And uh, yes, in this work we have established quite nice parallels with real chemistry. Couple more examples of um, what can we model with DM. This is for example, this is what's called Hundreds. The non-spherical shape with a, with a convex homogeneous model with a single point of equilibrium. And here is modeled with uh, basically an assembly of rigid spheres. Another thing that I don't really have time to talk in much details, but I really enjoy one. Smart particle that is able to change its tensor of inertia in order to adjust its orientation with respect to axis of rotation. I won't be detailing how, how does it work, but that's, that's really fun. Um, basically, the orange uh, vector is the desirable orientation, the uh, purple vector is, is current angular velocity vector, and the goal of the maneuver, that is basically the change of the principal uh, moments of inertia, is to match these two and uh, certain performance, certain ODE constraint optimization, we can do th these sort of things. So that part of the talk I hope demonstrated that DM is a little more than uh, rock mechanics. <laughs> and uh, with having that in mind, I would like to talk a little bit about modeling continuum with uh, particles, DM particles. And uh, in that respect, uh, uh, I would like to recall you about Oravon's watch. Like, uh, what is the difference? Uh, what can we bring new to the field of uh, modeling of the continuum? Besides? Like, if you reproduce stress-strain uh, behavior, constitutive properties of something, does not really mean you understand <laughs> things about uh, what's going on inside, about underlying mechanisms. Like, uh, for example, if uh, something observed, like transitions that I have been demonstrating, like BCC to CI16, that's obviously really hard to capture on the continuum level. Um, of course, uh, any result of uh, DM modeling, you, you can try to capture on the, on the continuum level, but the questions are whether it's possible and uh, whether it's necessary, whether it's useful. Uh, the answer to the first question is clearly Yes, if you have a representative volume element, size independent representative volume element, uh, then it's possible. Whether it's uh, useful and necessary, that's uh, another question that I will try to uh, address later. But let me say a few words uh, about uh, one dimensional structures first. Uh, with when we come to the continuum, let's start with rods. Um, assume we have. Um, the chain of the rigid bodies. Clearly, a single rigid body has six degrees of freedom with respect to the other rigid body. And if we talk in the context of uh, bonding behavior, we can talk about uh, uh, six different independent bond stiffnesses and correspondingly six independent eigenfrequencies, etc., etc. And uh, how do we introduce this sort of bonding behavior? Historically, the first one was parallel bond uh, that was offered by Pationde and Kandel. This is basically an incremental bond. They did it in incremental manner because they did not want really to track the orientations of the particles because their particles were spherical. And um, yes, even this mo model of bond actually gave a lot to the community. People managed to model the continuum and failure of the continuum as a basically set of bonded rigid bodies. And it's 
appear to be extremely useful for many type of solids, especially it has been hardly, largely explored in geomaterials. <coughs> Sorry. Then the other uh, type of uh, the model has been suggested. Not the only one I would have to, to highlight this one. And uh, this is what's called uh, extended vector bond model. And this is based on the full potential of interaction between two non-spherical bodies. This is a work uh, by Vitaly Kuskin um, and uh, his colleague, not don't remember the name. <laughs> Someone Asonov. Um, this model, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, this model is basically based on the potential that depends on invariance, and this is a very nice feature. This is an objective potential. There is a straightforward way you can uh, factor out forces, contact forces, and moments, and uh, you can easily calibrate uh, Euler Bernoulli or Timoshenko beam kind of behavior. I use this sort of bonds to model fibrillar materials uh, with a quite uh, nice success. You can model pretty much any uh, behavior of the fibers, bundles, uh, packing of the fibers within the bundle, formation of very complex nonlinear structures like plectonemes or solenoids. And uh, surprisingly, you can calibrate it for a small strain but the whole structure beha behaves in extremely uh, complicated large deformation ways. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, this is the work uh, of uh, uh, another scientist who actually calibrated the large strain deformations as well. But in fact, uh, even having the deformations uh, that are incrementally small at the level of the contacts between particles give you very precise tool to uh, model the deformation of the rods. One example of application is the carbon nanotubes and materials that are based on carbon nanotubes. That has been the topic of my research for quite a long time. Um, carbon nanotubes are basically semi-flexible polymers that are uh, almost insensitive to the temperature and they don't perform like uh, um, conformations because of the temperature. They're, they're just too steep for that. From that perspective, these are, uh, can be modeled as a thermal structures. They are very stiff. Uh, they have extremely high Young's modulus, and uh, they basically exhibit uh, molecular level properties at the macro scale. You can have a monocrystal of the 20 centimeter long. That basically something amazing. And we uh, used DM to model these sort of systems, and. Uh, Basically, there are uh, challenges to model like covalent bonding within the carbon nanotube and model Van der Waals adhesion between those. Van der Waals potential of interaction between two non-spherical segments is a, is a big challenge. It took me quite an effort to accomplish it. Uh, and we managed to achieve this sort of modeling. And um, yes, this was historically our first um, um, thing that we managed to model. This is a basically self-folded configuration of FCNT. It's a it's stable configuration. Then we went to much, much larger systems like carbon nanotubes films and uh, three-dimensional carbon nanotubes configurations. One interesting thing that we observed in these sort of systems that we do have a representative volume element in this sort of systems if we introduce this energy dissipation. So basically, we can achieve size independency of the, our stress strain curves if we introduce certain amount of energy dissipation. And uh, basically, basically, our initial physics gives you its viscous dissipation when you, we talk about sliding of molecularly smooth surface, which carbon nanotubes are. Um, Without energy dissipation, it just fails in a thinner place and does not perform RVE behavior at all. That was an interesting observation here. One uh, story about why do I believe uh, GM is a really useful tool to model failure at uh, much uh, higher and at, for, for a much wider class of systems 
is the fact that, indeed, the failure usually occurs at the scale that is different than the scale that is responsible for um, elastic behavior. And the DEM is a very na natural tool to capture these sort of things. An example is uh, basically cross-linked cross carbon nanotubes. And uh, you can see that uh, irrespectively of the segment size that we model with a single discrete element, we can resolve pretty fine uh, shear interaction that is because of the inter interstitial atom. And uh, this is basically the reason why um, uh, Basically, the DEM gives us a natural separation of scales compared, for, exa for example, with MD method that could not model these sort of things. Fortunately, for the reasons of time, I have to hurry up a little bit. And a um, few, few words about composites and metastructures. Um, don't really need to explain what composites are in this audience. And uh, metastructures is basically uh, zero void material composites uh, with some unusual properties that are rarely found in nature. Uh, we've had a paper exploring, exploring uh, two-dimensional um, uh, interior of Hash and Strickman bounds with different sorts of composites. and. Um, established uh, um, certain techniques, how to find those composites, and... Um, sorry? Oh. My apologies. I'm doing my best here. <laughs> All right. So, um, <clears throat> yes, um, this sort of... Uh, Metamaterials and microstructures can cover the interior of all, po all possible uh, uh, elastic properties of the void material composites in two dimensions. And uh, with this uh, work, we almost completely covered all the interior of uh, hashin stickman bounds or Cherkai-Gibiansky bounds. And um, three years after, the, the other author put the very large period in the topic. So, all right, the problems with uh, this sort of uh, metastructures are stress concentrations. And here, I think, the DEM is really a way to go. Like, when it comes to modeling the large, set, large uh, structures of um, um, multiple periods of certain st structures, etc., et um, the DEM can naturally capture this sort of behavior with a relatively small number of degrees of freedom and uh, explicitly model failure and uh, not only the onset of failure but also the uh, global consequences of the failure like uh, uh, what happens with the whole structure if uh, f plastic deformation or fracture has been initiated in one side of it or questions like that. All right. Uh, so, uh, what is the central factor which I believe uh, behind the efficiency of the DEM for modeling, model, um, mo for modeling solids? I believe the thing is the stress in any real solid is always in homogeneous. The, basically, uh, this here is a quite primitive illustration of it. Like that's uh, from the paper detailing uh, force chains in this pile of sand with a very, very slight uh, degree of polydispersity of the particles. Any inhomogeneity or bra break in the like, uh, crystalline structure of the thing immediately causes formation of clusters. So therefore, it's very natural to see some places as the passive, uh, like uh, rigid bodies, and the, the, the interfaces between those are some process zones that need to be resolved within the contact models. So the uh, discrete element method uh, very naturally attacks these sort of things. Quite a big challenge that I'm really trying to approach with DM is the modeling of failure of composites. And this here is a real mess. Like uh, in the composite science and technology, there is a competition for prediction of energy re release rate and these sort of things. And uh, there is 
at this point, uh, there is no way XFM, BM, or uh, phase field, they don't really reproduce the reality. The processes in this sort of uh, This was closed. Mm -hmm. Now you can speak there. Um, oh, now I can speak. <laughs> <laughs> All over again. Well, both who are simply muted. No, oh, now wow. it's open this one. Okay, let's go to slide one. <laughs> um, okay, I think the conclusion remark I would like to say. Uh, is that, uh, of course, the, 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 the very major thing here, if we homogenize the behavior of multiple interaction rigid bodies, you all understand what, kind, what sort of continuum we expect to see. It should be some sort of micropolar continuum, right? But uh, from uh, what we observed so far, that only matters for acoustics. It actually, when you deal with dispersive relations, dispersive relationships, you can immediately see the effects of non-symmetry of stress tensor, non-zero non coupled stresses and stuff like that. Uh, for the static or low wavelength things, uh, these this matters are usually not important. Um, yes, for, for, for the sake of the time, I unfortunately I could not go too, much, too deep into details of the things I wanted to, to say, but uh, with that, um, I would like to conclude. I hope <laughs> I managed to deliver at least some of the ideas that I, I originally wanted. Thank you very much. Thank you.